So I'm going to, as the Prof has said throughout this course, I'm going to reiterate the points that he's made in the PowerPoint presentation by showing you the specimens and uh, hopefully by seeing them in the sort of three dimensions or if it's seeing them rotated around, it'll help uh, you appreciate the anatomy a little bit um, or even better than the PowerPoint slides. Now what I'm starting with is uh, the cast that Prof has already described to you and this is a cast of an adult human heart and you can see that the cast is in fact in two parts and you can see that the the right half of the heart has been cast in blue. Here you can see the right atrium, ventricle, and the pulmonary trunk. And the left uh, half of the heart, left side of the heart, has been cast in red. So I can put these two together and uh, show you the, the, um, the whole of the heart and how an interrelationship between the chambers of the heart. Now, as we've said already, the problems um, have occurred in the past because We've um, described the heart as if it sits on its apex like this, so that the right-sided structures are towards the right, and the left-sided structures, the left atrium, the left ventricle, are more towards the left. And in order to be able to understand cardiac anatomy and the relationship of one chamber to another, the relationship of one valve to another, we need to be, able to, uh, we need to be considering the heart as if it sits in the body, as it's sitting in the body, which is in this sort of oblique orientation. And we need to consider this position, uh, whether we're looking at a fetal heart or a um, sort of mid-gestation fetal heart or whether we're looking at an adult heart. There'll be slight differences in the angulation of the apex if we're looking prenatally as opposed to uh, neonatal or adult life, primarily because of the large fetal liver. But essentially, the relationship of the structures will be very similar. So as I'm showing you this heart or this cast, uh, in attitudinally uh, correct position, then it's apparent to you that, as it is to me, that the right-sided uh, right structures, the right heart structures, are now moved in front of the left heart structures. So let me just point out um, some of these, uh, these components. You can see coming into the roof of the right atrium, here we've got the superior carval vein. This tube here uh, is the superior carval vein. And then at the base of the right atrium, we have the inferior carval vein. And they form the right border, then, of the cardiac, sil of cardiac silhouette. You can see the right atrium here, which will emphasize the structure of a little bit later on. And then the right ventricle, which really fills the front of the chest and sits immediately behind the sternum, which would be in place of my finger uh, here. Now, with the heart in this attitudinally correct position, then, we see very, very little of the left heart structures. You can just see that towards the apex, we have a small sliver of the left ventricle visible uh, behind the, the right ventricle. And then if we look towards the pulmonary trunk, then sometimes, but not always, we'll see um, the tip of the left atrial appendage just poking around the left border of the pulmonary trunk. So we see relatively little of the left heart structures. As we said, that's primarily because they sit behind the right heart uh, in attitudinally correct position. Now, if we look from above, then, the plane of the heart, the long axis of the heart, which is in this direction, so the long axis clearly is from the apex of the heart through the, effectively through the aortic valve and through the base of the heart, which is uh, here. The long axis of the heart, then, is directed at approximately 45 degrees um, to the anteroposterior axis of the body. So this is if we're looking at the heart from the head, from um, down from above. So the chambers are orientated, and the ventricular septum is orientated at this angle, 45 degrees. So that's the um, that's the cast of the heart as the chambers. And that's how the chambers would sit uh, within the chest. Let me now show you first um, actual heart. And this is, a, this is a, a, uh, a heart which was not used for a transplant. It was not possible to be used for transplant. And we've, uh, um, we were able to obtain it um, from a tissue bank. Uh, and as you'll see, it's quite a nice example of a normal heart. What I'm going to show you then is the position that this heart would uh, occupy in the chest. So 
This is the heart as it would sit in the chest in attitudinally correct position. And then from that, we can work out the borders of the heart as Prof has uh, begun to describe to you. So with the heart in this position, then we clearly have a very flat surface inferiorly here, which is the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. If I tip it up, you'll see that the, the surface of the right ventricle and the left ventricle, which would be more posterior, is relatively flat. And this sits immediately on the diaphragm, um, obviously with the pericardium in between. So we have the diaphragmatic border of the heart here. This is the, the right uh, side. Again, you can see the superior carval vein coming in the roof of the right atrium just there. The inferior carval vein coming in the roof, sorry, the floor of the right atrium just, uh, just there. We have the apex, which is pointing towards the stomach. And this is then the base of the heart between the, um, or the base of the ventricular mass, we'll call the base of the heart, which is effectively uh, at the level of the atrioventricular valves between the right and left atriums and the ventricular mass. And then we can look at the other borders. So this is the upper surface of the heart. This is the surface which would sit uh, alongside the left lung. So we can call this a pulmonary border uh, of the heart. And then we have two further margins. Because if I turn the heart around to show you from its apex, you'll see that it looks effectively like a, a squashed cone. It's squashed in this, um, in, uh, in this sort of caudal cranial axis. Uh, squashed, um, flattened cone. And we've got two uh, important margins of the heart, which you'll be familiar with. On the left side, more posterior side, you'll see that the angle between the superior surface of the heart here and the uh, posterior surface just here uh, forms an obtuse angle. I'm showing you with my fingers. So this is then the obtuse margin of the heart, and you can see that it's irrigated by the obtuse marginal branches of the uh, circumflex uh, coronary artery. And then if we look at the other uh, border, which would be towards the front. So as I'm showing you the heart here, the spine would be at the back here, where my finger is. The sternum would be at the front. And the sternum would run across this margin here, along the front border of the heart, just there. And at this front border of the heart, you can see there's a much sharper angle between the diaphragmatic surface of the heart the flat diaphragmatic surface of the heart that I showed you a moment ago, and this uh, front wall of the right ventricle. So we have a very acute angle um, at the front part of the heart, and this is then the acute margin of the heart. And as you can see then, this uh, clearly is irrigated by, again by coronary arteries, the acute marginal branches. So there are um, several borders of the heart that we can use we can use to describe, and you'll hear us using these terms throughout the course as we go through congenitally malformed hearts. Um, but uh, we need to, be able to, need to be considering the heart as it sits in the chest in this uh, attitudinally correct uh, fashion. Now, Prof illustrated to you a few of the problems that have occurred because we, um, we've named parts of the heart as if it sits in the chest in, in Valentine's fashion. And what I'm showing you here is a heart in which we've dissected away the um, epicardial surface to show you the coronary arteries. And I wanted to show you the course of the coronary arteries just briefly, although we'll cover this in a little later session, um, and to show you the, re the relationship between the coronary arteries then in short axis section. So I'm showing you, first of all, the posterior border of the heart, and I'm showing you the left coronary artery here, which is arising from the left-facing sinus. And you can see it's dividing off into a left anterior descending coronary artery, what we call a left anterior descending coronary artery traditionally, and the circumflex coronary artery, which is then meandering down between the left atrial appendage and the left ventricle. And then if I turn the heart over, you'll see that irrigating the diaphragmatic surface of the heart, this flattened diaphragmatic surface of the heart, we have a second coronary artery, and you can see that it's running down then between the two ventricles, and it's then crossing over, or part of it is crossing over to supply, in this heart, to supply the posterior, what we call the posterior border of the left ventricle, which as you see is actually the diaphragmatic surface and is inferior. So we've got two coronary arteries, 
um, one superior and one inferior. And as I said, traditionally we call this the left anterior descending coronary artery, and this one we call the posterior descending coronary artery. But if we put the heart in attitudinally correct fashion, you'll clearly see that this one is above the other one. This one is certainly superior to the posterior descending coronary artery. So really we have a superior artery and an inferior artery, and they're probably better described as superior and inferior interventricular uh, coronary arteries. Now if I just take a section, uh, if I show you a section then across the heart in short axis, so if we make a cut um, directly across both of the ventricles in a, in a short axis section of the heart, then hopefully you can see the relationship with the coronary arteries much better. So here's uh, that section. Let me just orientate you once again. This is the left ventricle. You're seeing the circular profile of the left ventricle. The spine would be in this position uh, here. The front of the chest would be here. So this is the sternocostal border of the heart. Uh, and the diaphragm would then be sitting along this margin here. And again, you can see the flat diaphragmatic surface uh, of the heart. The pulmonary trunk is um, just a little bit further up from this section. So again, you can see the, the borders of the heart that I've already described to you. Just in passing, you can see that this uh, angle here is acute. So this is the acute margin of the heart, and the angle more posteriorly along this border is obtuse. So this is the obtuse margin of the heart. Now, if we look at the coronary arteries that you can see in this section, you can see that um, we have a coronary artery and, in fact, a coronary vein very close to it um, at the top here. And this is what we call the left anterior descending coronary artery. And clearly it's superior um, than, rather than uh, anterior. And then if we look below, you'll see there's two uh, small vessels here. They're slightly smaller um, than the previous example that I showed you. But in fact, this is a vein. So this is the... Um, the middle cardiac vein, and here you can see the coronary artery just next to it there. So this is what we normally would call the posterior descending coronary artery just there, and clearly it's inferior. Clearly it's running along the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. Now as well as that, if I put a line um, from a cranial caudal line across the heart here, then you can see that as well as being um, superior and inferior, this artery at the top here is also more positioned more posteriorly than this artery. So really the names we call these arteries are uh, very incorrect. Um, whether we change them or not is another matter, but we need to recognize that the way we name these structures and the way we name most of the structures within the heart is not in an attitudinally correct fashion but as if the heart would sit uh, on its apex. So finally, I just wanted to show you uh, one specimen, again, another explanted heart, just to illustrate to you the relative position of the cardiac valves um, in attitudinally correct fashion. So what we've done in this particular specimen is we've made several cuts. We've taken away the apex, first of all. Um, this is the diaphragmatic surface of the heart. This is the right ventricle in which we've cut open a window to show you uh, both the tricuspid and the pulmonary valves. And then what we've also done, if I turn it around and show you the heart from the base, is we've taken away uh, both of the walls of the atriums. So this is the right atrium and this is the left atrium here to show you um, the cardiac valves on FAS, to show you the relationship of one cardiac valve to another. So as I've turned the heart around, I'm just going to orientate you once more. This is the front of the chest. This is the front of the heart. So the sternum would be here. The, the spine would be more towards the back. This is the diaphragmatic surface just here. And what you can see is that both the inlet valves to the heart are orientated in a very similar plane. This is the tricuspid valve, which is positioned perhaps slightly lower, just slightly lower than the mitral valve, which is on this side. You can see the coronary sinus, which is running around um, the inferior aspect of the mitral valve and entering the floor of the right atrium just here. 
So both of the inlet valves in a very similar plane, and that's why echocardiographers can cut across the heart and see uh, both of the inlet valves, the tricuspid and mitral valves, in a four-chamber plane. And then as we move up, we'll see that the arterial valves are stacked on top of the inlet valves in sequence. So the aortic valve is the first valve we come across, and that's very much wedged in between the two inlet valves of the heart, and we'll emphasize that uh, a little bit further in future presentations. So the aortic valve is then wedged between the two inlet valves, and is the next valve that we come across in sequence as we move towards the head. And then finally, the pulmonary valve, which you see here, is uh, stacked on top and is the most superior valve within the cardiac silhouette and is positioned to the left of the aortic valve. So even though it comes from the right heart, comes from the right ventricle, the pulmonary valve is positioned towards the left and posterior to the aortic valve. So that's as the valves sit uh, in the heart. As you've seen, we can see that on MRI. Nowadays, very clearly, we can see the relationship of one cardiac valve to another, and we need to be considering them in attitudinally correct uh, orientation.